Today, Tio Norway TV has visited Oslo University, Faculty of Humanities, Institute of Cultural Studies and Orientalic Languages. The reason why Tio Norway TV has visited Oslo University is that interview Professor Ragnar Johannes Ruth Zorgati, who knows the details of the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet. Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet is the winner of Nobel Peace Prize 2015. Professor Ragnihit Johannes Ruth Zorgati have a multidisciplinary background with specialization in religious history, Islamic studies, and comparative literature. In her research, she has focused on religious and cultural encounters between Muslims and Christians from conversions in Abraham medieval their cultural meetings human 1800s. Now she participates in two research areas one value politics Valpor with a study of conflicting values in the in the Tunisian constitution 2014 and tracing the Jerusalem court Christian cultures in Scandinavia, where she analyzed Scandinavian 1800s depictions of the Holy Land. Uh, first, can we start with uh, Mohammed Bouzidi? Who was he? Uh, he was a street vendor <coughs> in the town of Sidi Bouzid, mm -hmm. in one of the remote uh, inner parts of Tunisia, mm -hmm. which is not very rich, a very poor region. Okay. Uh, and he set fire on himself because he felt indi indignified by the police yeah. uh, or by the authorities uh, that he didn't get a permission to work. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, from that his really desperate action, it ignited the entire situation and mm. you had more and more demonstrations and the demonstrations, they went from the rural, rural areas or the inner parts, inner regions mm. of Tunisia mm. and then they went into the main cities, into Tunis mm. and from uh, having perhaps more, most unemployed youth mm been organized and the UGTT, the, the Tunisian Workers' Organization, got involved and it helped to organize the protests and then the, up, the middle and upper classes in Tunis got involved and you had lawyers, uh, university people, everybody together in order to, to demonstrate against the regime. And then the military did not take part with the dictator and then at a certain time he left the country, he chose to leave the country. The military was against the... The military, the, the, one of the, the main general uh, mm. of the Tunisian military, he mm. told, this is what people said. Okay. I have not verified the, the, the information, but people said that he was asked, that he informed Ben Ali that he was not going to shoot on his own people. And from that on, uh, the, I think uh, Ben Ali, he had his security forces, Very good. Uh, but who is Mohammed Bouzizi now in Tunisia and in Arab world? Uh, some people see him as a martyr yeah. and they do have photos of him on the walls. Yeah. But there are a lot of different stories about what actually happened. Mm. Uh, and I have not dealt uh, into that issue, so I'm not an expert. But what people agree on is that his desperate act actually, uh, yeah, was a trigger okay. for the situation to yeah. to really increase in Tunisia. That people got so fed up about everything that they had been living through, mm -hmm. and that this desperate act it moved people to act. Okay. But you know there had been demonstrations before in 2008, uh -huh. and even in the 80s, you had you have had a strong civil society, a strong civil society movement, mm -hmm. which sometimes mm -hmm. have challenged the regime. Yeah. Mm. How was the National Dialogue Quartet established? The National Dialogue Quartet was, was established on the initiative uh, mainly by the UGTT, the mm. Workers' Union, mm -hmm. and it came at a very important uh, juncture in the transition process because you know that 
Wazisi, he put himself on fire in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 2011, uh, you had elections for a new government okay. in the autumn of 2011. Yeah. And at that point, the Islamist party, Nahda, mm -hmm. uh, won the elections and they uh, became the majority in the constituent assembly. And they also uh, formed a government together with two secularist parties. But Nahda or the Islamists were the real um, main, uh, the main player in the government. Mm. And this created fears among the secularists, part of the Tunisian population. Mm. Uh, and uh, you really had an ideological conflict with a lot of debate and discussion yeah. in public space, in the television, on radio, but also in families, uh, where religion and identity were really debated issues because people they asked what kind of society do we want to have yeah. what role should religion play in politics and in the state should we have a secular state or a religiously based state yeah. all these questions were debated and you have had really a really tense situation and then in 2013 first in february yeah. one opposition politician from the um, on the on the very uh, left hand side of the political spectrum he was killed uh, and some people his wife accused the government the Islamist government of being indirectly responsible for the death of her husband mm -hmm. because she, she she thought that he was in yeah in in that the government collaborated with these extremists that she claimed killed her husband mm -hmm. the government uh, denied all these claims uh, and then, but you had huge demonstrations, and during his funeral, you had massive uh, mobilization among uh, the, yeah, the, the secularist perhaps, but also working pl class people, the UGTT. You had a mass mobilization, and then, uh, and then uh, the situation calmed down a little bit in the spring. Uh, but in the summer of 2013, you had a new assassi assassination mm -hmm. uh, on the 25th of July, which is a very symbolic date because it's the uh, the day of the Republic. So those people who uh, killed the other leftist uh, politicians, they did it on the day of the Republic. So that was seen as a message that these are people who are against a republican system, who are against uh, the state as uh, Tunisians know the state, and that they are against uh, the parliamentary system. system. Okay. Uh, and also uh, one thing that was said was that this politician, he was leftist, but mm. he was a practicing Muslim. So they could not use the argument that he was a kefir against him, mm. which they had used against the first that was killed, that he mm. was not a true Muslim. But this guy, he practiced Islam. Uh, and then, of course, after that assassination, the government was accused of not being in, in uh, not being able to to secure the politicians in society, and you had an enormous cleavage between the secularist opposition and the Islamist-led government. Uh, and then some uh, parliamentarians, they choose to withdraw from the Constituent Assembly mm. uh, in order not to follow it. We, because they said that uh, we are not heard in all the committees. Finally, Nahda takes the, uh, has the final saying and we disagree and we will not be part of this. So they withdraw and they demonstrated in what is called the Bardo rallying. Uh, but then, the, um, uh, the, also the president of the, the Constituent Assembly, mm -hmm. he saw the, the situation... No, no, this okay. is not the quarter. Okay. It okay. has nothing to do with the quarter. Okay. He saw the situation as so difficult mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, dangerous that he decided to dissolve the Constituent Assembly in oh, August yeah. mm. in order uh, for all the participants to calm down <laughs> mm. and try to, to, to settle their disagreements before reconvening. Mm. And this is the moment in, after the assassination of the second leftist politician, this is the situation where the quartet gets into the political play. Okay. 
because you have you had the politicians they had demonstrated according to some that they were not able neither the islamist majority nor the secularist opposition they were not able to to calm the situation down or to rule the country uh, and to stabilize the country mm. uh, so then and it was also a very difficult economic situation because of instab instability and less tourists etc which were unofficial uh, behind closed doors mm. uh, and uh, that the negotiations were very hard mm. and difficult, uh, but also the head of the UTK, she said that uh, they had to be, to persevere and never to cede and just to stand on their position, uh, even though the negotiations were extremely difficult. Uh, and I think something that many actors involved in this <laughs> late uh, August beginning of the autumn, what they would agree on, even if they would disagree on almost everything else, mm. uh, was that the situation was extremely dangerous, mm. that you had opposing groups, that if violent violence had broken out, it could be very, very diff uh, a very volatile and dangerous situation. Uh, so the vice president of the parliament, who, who at, the, at the time, mm. uh, she was in Oslo last week, and she said that uh, the presidents of the Constituent Assembly, mm -hmm. he mm -hmm. decided to put off offences between two demonstrating groups, the opposition on one hand and the majority Islamist government or sympathizers mm -hmm. with Islamists on the other. And they were really criticized for putting up those fences. Okay. Uh, but she said she did not regret it because she saw the situation as so dangerous. So I think uh, that was why the quoted uh, got the Nobel Peace Prize or were nominated for the prize mm -hmm. and why also they were chosen by the committee because they uh, were able through dialogue and through talking mm. to reach a compromise that was possible acceptable for everyone but the labor union were they independent of the final uh, region uh, people will say different things here. Mm. I think during their history, I'm not a specialist of okay. the working, working union, mm. uh, but they, uh, as far as I have understood, they mm. have uh, played a semi-independent role, and it has been dependent on personalities, okay. and it has, has been dependent on uh, different periodical... Uh, they have played different roles in different historical periods, mm. but they have, uh, since... Uh, the French colonizing time or the French colony in Tunisia or the protectorate as they say they have played a major role first for the independence of Tunisia and then for the development of the so society so they have of course they are um, controversial mm. uh, perhaps some uh, but they, they, they organize a great important part of society and sometimes they have been close to the regime and in other times they yeah. have made huge demonstration against the regime. Okay, how many tribes are in Tunisia or religious groups, tribes? Uh, in, Tunisia, in Tunisia, if you talk mm. about tribes, mm. I think the concept of tribe it's only operational now in the very southern part of Tunisia okay. and even if I say that it will would be controversial by some, uh, because uh, after in after the independence from France, uh, there has been a project, a nation-building project in Tunisia, uh, where tribal affiliation is less important, and mm. the affiliation to your local community and to the state, to the nation, has been very important, and it it has been, um, you know. Um, uh, I mean, enhanced through schooling, yeah. etc. So, in Tunisia today, as according to statistics, 99% uh, are Sunni Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, a small percent of Shia. Mm -hmm. You have some Ibadi in mm -hmm. the southern part. Mm -hmm. uh, you have small groups of Christians, small groups of Jews. Okay. But it's a very homogeneous society. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to tribes, tribes do not play such an important role in Tunisian politics. And there is many group uh, or any separatist group. 
Scotland wants to be independent or separate or no. divides a country. No, no, no. But you have other divisions. You have divisions between regions. Yeah. You have the uh, the the coastal area mm -hmm. with Tunis in the north mm -hmm. and Sus and Svax in the south. These yeah. are important cities, and this is the most developed region. Okay. Uh, and then you have the interior parts and the southern parts, which, which are less uh, developed. Mm. Uh, and if you see, look to political leadership, mm. you will see that during the French protectorate, most political leaders came from Tunis. Mm. Uh, after independence, most they came from the region of Sus and Monastir. Uh, and then with the Islamists, you have more people also coming from the south. Mm. So there are regional uh, differences, which you can see also in politics. Can you say something about the new institution and the last election and uh, dialogue? The new, the, the, the new constitution? Yeah. Yeah, because the, one of the results of the dialogue, the national dialogue that were awarded yeah. <laughs> the Nobel Peace Prize, yeah. was that in uh, January 2014, mm. uh, the Tunisians uh, pa the Tunisian parliament could, or constituent assembly, they could sign uh, the new constitution. Uh, and this constitution, in many respects, is very progressive. Uh, it endorses human rights, okay. civil and political, mm -hmm. as well as uh, economic, social and cultural rights. Mm. Uh, so in that respect, it's very progressive, and it also um, establishes equality between men and women. Uh, so in fam or uh, women are equal citizens to men. Mm. Mm. And dialogue as a tool. Uh, dialogue as a tool, I think, uh, what I find interesting is that uh, perhaps you could say that in Tunisian society, within families, for a long time you have had uh, a capacity to negotiate if there has been conflicts between different parts of families, mm. for instance. Yeah. Uh, and I would assume, even if I had, no, I have not done any scientific research on this, mm. but I would think that uh, this kind of knowledge yeah. could be put into uh, political processes too, mm. uh, so that the dialogue. Uh, what is important with the dialogue was that it was civil society based. Mm -hmm. It was not the politicians, but it was civil society who started it. But then the politicians they joined. Mm. So. You have to acknowledge that you had strong civil society leaders, but you also had very strong political leaders mm. who chose and accepted the dialogue. And what Tunisians often say to me is that we do not like violence, we do not like war. Mm. We prefer to, to resolve our conflicts uh, through talking. Mm. And at least that is what they were able to demonstrate the national dialogue about it. How was Tunisia be able to create a homogeneous society, a society which believes in one Tunisia as a nation, as a country? Yeah, you, you asked me about if there were any separatist groups. Yeah. Or mm -hmm. uh, my reading now is that you do not have separatist groups, but you have, very, you have some small uh, religious communities mm -hmm. uh, who are not for the republic, who are not in favor of democracy, uh, but who would like to establish a society based on what for them represent Islamic principles. Okay. So mm. we have a, a, a Salafi movement, but it's not very important. It's, it's not an... Ex it's not dominant. It's not dominant at all. Uh, but you have all also with the, within the mainstream political spectrum, mm -hmm. which ranges from Islamists to secularists, mm -hmm. you have uh, people, most people, they agree on the democratic principles. Mm. And it's very important to know that the Islamists, they voted in favor of this very progressive constitution. Mm. So they have an interpretation of Islam yeah. which, where Islam is compatible with democracy. With democracy. That's yeah. one of the findings. Yes. Yeah. One of the learning. What can other countries learn from Tunisia? I think what, um, I mean, I'm not going to be a moralizing person and say what others could learn and what, I can say what I learn. 
Yeah. I, what, okay. what I learned from the Tunisian experience is that even even though things are really hard and really difficult in yeah. human relations, mm -hmm. it's always better to talk than to fight. That's and okay. I, I think I think that that's something that uh, that's a method for work. That's a method that you should use in your family in raising your children. Associate Professor uh, Arad Mir Johannes Rud Zurgati. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your interesting Thank explanation. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay.